Hi, I'm Jasmine with Samuel's Ranch Sustainable. Samuel's Ranch is a working sheep ranch. And one of the first questions we usually get asked is what breed of sheep we run. And it's pretty complicated these days to answer. From 1968 till 2007, we were raising and registering Hampshire sheep. Hampshires are a meat breed from England. They're the traditional cartoon sheep. You might recognize them. They have black faces and legs with wool on their foreheads, cheeks, and legs, and white woolly bodies. Now, we really loved the Hampshires, but over the years, we found it very difficult to find Hampshire rams that were hardy enough to keep up with the life on our mountain. We have very rough terrain up here. Our slopes are between 30 and 70 percent, and we have very variable temperatures, ranging from freezing with a little bit of snow in the winter to triple digit heat in the summer. Now, after multiple expensive Hampshire rams that just couldn't keep up with our wild and woolly ewes and our rugged lifestyle, we started experimenting with other breeds. Our first was a Dorset, and we were very happy with how vigorous and healthy those Dorset Hamp crosses were. Eventually we tried a Coredale, and he was one of the best rams we ever had. And now we are completely committed to crossbreeding and making composites. When I was young, crossbred sheep were kind of looked down upon and considered to be only good for market. But now, careful crossbreeding is considered as making a composite, a purposeful combination of breeds that's moving towards its own new breed. And composite rams are doing better and better at shows and sales. Now, crossbreds tend to be healthier, hardier, and better performing than purebred sheep. This is because of two factors. The first is hybrid vigor, also known as heterostasis. Hybrid vigor is the phenomenon in which crossbred offspring outperform the average individual of either parent breed. Um, and this is something that's seen across different species. It's one reason that you see so many black baldies, which are a hybrid of Hereford and black Angus cattle out on the range. The second factor is breed complementarity. Breed complementarity is the art of crossing different breeds with different strengths to get offspring that have the best traits of either parent breed. Now, one of the side benefits that's a little more superficial is that our crossbred sheep have a variety of face markings and colors that are really quite fun to look at. And I'm sure you'll enjoy seeing all of our colorful crosses when you visit us on the ranch. I'm going to talk about some of the frequently asked animal husbandry questions. Some folks have concerns that sheep shearing might be dangerous or cruel to the animals. Now, in the wild, sheep actually do shed their coats, but over centuries of breeding, most of the domesticated breeds you see in North America have been bred to grow and grow and grow their wool continuously. They do not shed. Now, if we don't shear them, the really high insulative wool can actually cause heat exhaustion and stroke in sheep living in our hot California climates. So we do shear them for their own safety and comfort. We also have issues here with foxtails and ripgut brome seeds. Now you might have heard from your veterinarian that foxtails can be very dangerous to your dogs and cats. If they get into the coat and into the skin, the seeds can keep traveling and do damage. This is even more of a risk for sheep. Sheep don't generally get groomed and petted as much as your dogs and cats. It's very hard to find the foxtails if they get into the skin. So we shear them additionally to try to prevent that foxtail damage. Now there are breeds of sheep that do shed their coats and those are usually referred to as hair breeds. We are not using any of those breeds here on the ranch yet, but they're becoming increasingly popular in our area because the cost of shearing is going up and the value of wool in California has been consistently pretty low. 
So you might see sheep with coats that look closer to Labrador retrievers in length, like the Barbados, or you might see sheep that have traditional woolly looking coats that are also shedding. And those can look a little raggedy at a certain time of year, but they're not unhealthy. They don't have mange. That's just something that breeds like Dorpers and Romanovs do when it starts to get warmer out. They shed their woolly looking coats. When our lambs are born, they have long tails, and you might notice that the adults have short tails. Now, we dock or shorten the tails for health and hygiene purposes. Again, the sheep that we have don't shed their coats, and with a long tail and the wool, that area can get quite wet and warm, and that puts them at risk for something that's known as being fly-blown or also called fly strike. Flies can actually infect the soiled wool around the tail and cause numerous health issues for the sheep. So we do dock the tails to prevent that health issue. We dock them using a system known as the elastrator method. It's essentially a very strong, thick rubber band that we put over the tail at a certain point. It slowly cuts off the circulation and the body naturally heals itself above the band and the tail that's below the band will lose circulation, not have blood flow, and eventually fall off. There is no bleeding and there's very, very low risk of infection. In all of the years that my family's been docking with this method, we have never had any cases of infection. So it's quite safe for them. If you've been to some of the livestock shows at fairs, and then you look at some of our sheep, you might notice that our tails do tend to be a few inches longer than the tails at the show fairs. So even though docking tails is necessary to promote health and hygiene of the sheep, if you dock the tail too short, then you actually lose some of the functions of the tail and you put the sheep at greater risks for certain health issues especially prolapsing. Now, when I was in the fairs, when I was in 4-H, this short tails became very, very fashionable and popular. It's easier to shear a sheep with a very short tail and actual surgical removal of the tail so that they were quite short indeed became in vogue. Very rapidly, the health issues with doing that became known and different organizations tried to make it so that you couldn't show sheep with tails less than a certain length. But even at that length that's acceptable for shows, you still have a higher risk of prolapse. So we like to err on the side of longevity for our sheep. Prolapse is going to be a greater risk for sheep that are going to be actually breeding and living longer, especially if, like us, you tend to have high birth weights in your lambs, so big babies being born, or a high incidence of twinning, multiple babies being born at a time. It puts extra strain on the ewes, and we just prefer to give them a little bit longer tail to help with that. You might notice that our sheep have ear tags. Now, ear tags are used as identification, and they can be either flock tags that are used internally in that flock or on that ranch, and they might have identification of the individual and the individual's parent. On our ranch, we like to have the individual's identification and the mother's identification and the year that they were born. This allows us to better track who's related to who. If a sheep is going to be sold, they also need a government issued ID tag that links back to the breeder for tracking purposes. Ear tagging isn't very painful for the sheep. We do it when they're young and it is just like getting your ears pierced. The machine looks almost identical, just larger. And proportionally, it's about the same from our ears to theirs. And just like getting your ears pierced, it hurts for a moment or two, but then it's fine. And the hole heals up and there's very low risk of any infection or any problems from the tagging. I'd like to introduce you to Kaylin. 
Kaelin is a Great Pyrenees. Great Pyrenees are a 3,000 year old dog breed and they were bred to be livestock guardian dogs and to protect the family from wolves and bears and the, in the Pyrenean mountains of France. Nowadays, Kaelin and other livestock guardian dogs protect sheep in America and all over the world from predators ranging from mountain lions to coyotes to feral dogs. We have problems with all three of those species on our property. So we use livestock guardian dogs to help deter predators. You might notice that Kaylin is large. She is a bit above average for the breed. She is 135 pounds. Her brother Bob is 172 pounds and her other brother Bill is also 135. So this is considered an extra large or giant breed of dogs. Aside from her size, another of Kaylin's defenses and deterrence to predators is her large bark. You might see that she's a very deep chested breed and she has a very impressive bark. If you visit us on the ranch, she will bark at you. That is their main line of defense. These breeds have been raised to try to scare predators off before they engage. That protects the dog itself and also allows them to better protect the herd. So this is a dog that barks fairly frequently, especially during the night and anytime they hear strangers or disturbance. It's their first line of defense. Kaylin will not bite you if you come visit us, but she probably will bark at you until I've told her that it's okay and that she realizes that you're a welcome guest. That's just part of her breed's training. Now, Great Pyrenees and other livestock guardian breeds are not herding dogs. I get that question a lot. Kaylin does not herd the sheep. Herding breeds like Border Collies and Healers have actually been bred to hone their prey drive. They use a lot of their predatory body language to move the sheep. They are essentially intimidating the sheep into going the directions that they want them to go. Now, livestock guardian breeds like Kaelin have actually had their prey drive really bred out. They are very protective of animals that are weaker than themselves. Kaelin will not ever chase sheep, and a livestock guardian dog should not chase or herd sheep. Now, if you see a livestock guardian dog out in the field with their sheep, please understand that they're okay. You might see a lot of them in the Rio Vista area of Solano County, and you might notice that they're out there seemingly all alone, but they do have shelters, they do have water, they do have food, and they are checked on by the ranchers. These dogs have been bred over thousands of years to be very independent and to be able to take care of themselves and their charges, whether they be humans that they're taking care of, they love kids, or whether it's sheep. And please don't try to rescue them because you might actually be kidnapping or stealing them. Especially if you see a younger dog or a puppy out there, please don't interact with it. They're being trained to bond with the livestock. Please don't steal anyone's dogs. I know it's well-intentioned. I was asked to talk to you today about how we graze on the ranch. Specifically, someone asked me to talk about my rotational grazing system. Now, what's actually going to happen is I'm going to talk about why we're not using a rotational grazing system, literally. Now, when most people talk about or think about rotational grazing systems, what they're actually picturing is a short duration, high intensity grazing system that's based off of a system that was popularized by a certain individual and his affiliated entities. Now, this system proposes that you divide up your property into multiple, more than eight, equal pastures, and you put a high intensity and a high density of animals in each pasture and rotate them through rather quickly. The idea behind this being that 
when all of the animals are clustered together at high density, they're not going to be able to be picky about what they graze. And you'll see equal utilization of their preferred and non-preferred plants. They'll graze those off. And after a period of time, those plants will regrow and you can keep coming back to the same pasture over and over and over again. Now, there are places that that system works really well. Multiple studies have shown that that system can work if you're in an area where you're not limited by water, if you have a growing season that's over three months, relatively high productivity, flat terrain, and very uniform species composition in your pastures. That helps with making each pasture division an equal performing pasture division. Uh, those conditions are not our conditions here. When you come to visit us, or as you'll see on our hikes, our virtual hike we're going to do later today, this is not a flat area. Our slopes are between 30 to 70 percent, and we are blessed with biodiversity. We have everything ranging from oak woodlands to chaparral, and even within those, our pastures are not the same. We also are limited by water here. We are very dependent upon the precipitation, and like most of California, we are prone to drought. So a system that relies upon having a minimum of 20 inches precipitation during the growing season, which most studies have shown is what's necessary for that system, is not going to work well here. On an average year, we're lucky if we get 18 inches. So we're really not meeting those requirements. Instead, we do a modification of the seasonal suitability method. So in this method, you divide up your property into big pastures based on what's growing where. So for example, we're sitting in an oak woodland right here, and it's kind of fenced off into a big oak woodland blob. And in this oak woodland, we have oak trees, obviously not to scale here, but this is our, we have our oak woodland blobs. And then in other pastures, it's mostly chaparral. And chaparral is a shrubland ecosystem. It's generally very dense, and the species composition is completely different than in our oak woodlands. We have things like manzanita and chamise that dominate. And we have some more over here. And we also have our walnut orchards. And our walnut orchards need to be grazed differently as well. We have different species composition in the orchards. And when I talk about species composition, I mean what's growing that the sheep are going to potentially be eating. In the oak woodlands, you have some sort of oak tree cover, and then you have an herbaceous understory. And in between oak woodlands, that might be different. This one that I'm sitting in right now, we have oaks, but we also have a lot of non-native grasses. Whereas in a different one, we have oaks and we have mostly our native bunch grasses. Now, even though those are oak woodlands, we wanna graze those a little bit differently. We're trying to time our grazing based on the plants that are there. We're trying to reach a happy optimum timing between when the plants provide good food for the sheep and when the plants that we're trying to promote are not sensitive to being grazed. So in the areas that we have a lot of bunch grasses, we'll wait to graze there until those bunch grasses have set seed. And we'll actually harvest some of that bunch grass seed to try to put into other pastures. In the areas that have a lot of invasive annuals, we are going to try to graze those so that we're actually trying to limit seed production of those invasive annuals. And one way that we do that is with electric fence. We will use a lot of electric fence to further divide up these pastures. Say there's a lot of invasive annuals in this corner, but there's a lot of bunch grasses over here. We can fence those off and graze them separately with the 
with the electric fence. And as those plant communities shift over time, with the electric fence, we can reflect that very easily. Now, it's a lot of work. It's definitely harder than just letting the sheep out on the whole property all at once. But we believe that it's worth it to try to get the bunch grasses and the other native plants that we're trying to promote a better chance at competing with these invasive annuals that have been so dominant in most of California. Another reason that I prefer not to refer to our grazing system as rotational is that rotational tends to imply that there is a schedule for doing the movement. We do do a lot of movement of our sheep. We're moving them from pasture to pasture pretty frequently, but we're not doing it based on a schedule. We're not looking at a calendar and deciding, oh, it's been four days, we should move them now. We're looking at the plants. We're looking at the plants that we're trying to protect and not overgraze. And we're also looking at the plants that we really want to graze down. So we're basing our movements on phenology, not on a specific schedule. And this adaptive management, no matter what you call it, is in my opinion, the best management you can do. Really informing your decisions based on conditions in the field. And if you have questions about that and you'd like to learn more, please feel free to ask me. You can find us on our Facebook page, Samuels Ranch Sustainable, or please email me at samuelsranch at gmail.com. I actually used to be a lecturer at Humboldt State University talking about grazing. My master's research was on targeted grazing and it's really my passion. So if you have specific questions, please feel free to reach out and I can give you more detailed information. This weather turning from hot to rainy, hot to rainy, really interrupted our sheep shearing season. So right now we have a mixture of wild and woolly and slicker ladies. We use electric fence to help with our targeted grazing. We can move the fence to get exactly what species we want grazed when we want them. It takes more work than putting in permanent fence and just leaving it there, but it helps us reach our goals. If you are up here visiting us, we will either not have a fence on near you or we'll turn it off. But it's completely safe. We use a system that sends pulse instead of continuous charge through the fence and that kind is very safe. There's no fire hazard from that. It's also not nearly enough to be harmful to a person who's gotten shocked. Hey ladies. Now in future, we would like to offer opportunities for sheepnicks, sheep picnics, where you can come sit under the oak trees here or somewhere else, probably with our picnic table, and have a nice picnic with some new friends. Oh my goodness, you're so silly. We exclusively use sheep pruning on all of our trees. So silly. Hi, I'm Jasmine. And I'm Whitney. And we're here with our friend Serena. Today we're celebrating Serena's escape. <laughs> and her turning three months old. <laughs> so Serena is a little bit sassy right today but she's a bottle lamb. Do you want to talk about that? So when Serena was born, you can probably already tell, she's really big and that caused a really hard delivery for her mom, which meant that Serena's mom, Serenity, could not take care of her. So instead, we've been feeding her on the bottle. Let's see if she'll eat a little bit. Hey, Serena. Oh, yes. So Serena 
is a bottle lamb, and when lambs are born, they can't eat all of the foods their parents can eat yet, just like our babies. So they start out on the bottle, and as they get older, they transition to the hay. Oh, bless, oh, bless you. you. Oh, bless you, Serena. <laughs> Yay. So already Serena is starting to learn how to eat some hay, and her new favorite treat is grain. Serena, you want some grain? Oh, yes. Now, bottle lambs like Serena are exceptionally friendly people. Now, most of our sheep are friendly, <laughs> but bottle lambs tend to act a little bit more like dogs than like sheep. <laughs> In the future, we hope to offer opportunities for you to meet and interact with our friendliest sheep like Serena here. You could have a picnic with Serena if it's the right time of year, you might be able to feed a bottle lamb. Whitney, do you want to tell them about the first time you had a sheep <laughs> interact with people? Yeah, so Serena actually comes from a long line of friendly sheep. Her great-grandmother, Moondust, was actually the very first sheep from our ranch to go visiting she came when I was in kindergarten and did a lesson to my kindergarten class about sheep and bottle lambs. Yes, Mary had a little lamb that followed her to school and Whitney also had a bottle lamb who went in for show and tell. So, talk about their names. So the original name in this family tree was Moondust. She was a white faced ewe and we called her that because her face kind of resembled the white craters of the moon. And from that line, we have Serena and Serena's mom, Serenity, who are named after the seas or the patterns the craters make on the moon. So we like to name them down matrilineal lines and all of our sheep do have names. So if you come up and meet them, we'll be able to tell you who you're meeting. Dang. Oh yes. And you might notice that Serena here has a nice little earring. All of our sheep have ear tags. They help us identify them in a crowd, even though mostly we can tell them apart by their different faces. Now, right now, Serena's body wool is gray. With a lot of sheep breeds that have dark faces, the bodies are black when they're born and they lighten as they get older. So when you meet Serena, she might have white wool because she's a grown-up sheep. You can see at the base, she's got white roots and her face will probably stay about the same color. I'm out here with Serena and Whitney and in the background, can you pick out that deer? There. Yeah. It's camouflaged. It is. And the deer really don't mind the sheep being out here. They can graze and browse in the same pasture, no problem. Yeah. Now we'll pan to little baby Serena. Serena. Oh, she wants the oak leaves in the tree. Serena, oh, you Serena. Want to oak leaves? Oh, Serena. You're a little short to reach this right now, but when you get big, you might be able to. Yeah, so babies like Serena, they want to try everything, but they don't know exactly what they like yet. Adult sheep go crazy for oak leaves. It's a little... Do you want to try it? Mm, a little nibble nibble? We're exploring it. Yeah. Just like a human baby explores things. Yeah. But we're not quite sure what to do with it yet. And grazing is a learned behavior. So they do pick up a lot of what's good to eat, what to avoid from their peer group and their parents. So Serena has been kind of cloistered. She does get to see other sheep and other lambs all the time, but she doesn't have quite as much of a role model. As she gets older and she starts hanging out more and more in a group of just sheep and less and less with humans, she'll probably pick up some of those grazing habits. I don't think she's noticed that deer back there. Hey Serena. 
So on a hot day like today, when you're petting Serena, you might notice that her wool feels slightly greasy. And this is due to something called lanolin. Jasmine, can you tell us a little bit more about lanolin? Yes, so lanolin is a natural wax that the sheep produce in their skin, and it actually works to condition and protect their skin and their wool as it's growing. And lanolin is actually a key ingredient in most natural lotions, chapsticks, lip balms. So if you check the products you use, you might see lanolin. It's very good for skin. And in fact, we've started to try to process it and use it in our own homemade lotions and things. And one reason it is so good for skin is that our bodies react to it the same way the sheep's own skin would. It's for conditioning and protection, and it does the same thing for us. Hi, Serena. Thank you so much for watching today, especially if you made it all the way to the end here. If you'd like to get to see more of Kaylin or our other animals, the sheep, the other dogs, please follow us on Instagram at Samuels Ranch Sustainable or on Facebook, Samuels Ranch Sustainable. If you have questions for us, please reach out at samuelsranch at gmail.com and just stay tuned. We hope to be able to offer opportunities for you to come out and meet our animals and hike our beautiful ranch sometime in the near future. Thanks.